Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, let's see. So I am with a very wonderful crew, activated, engaged people in my home community of Marin County. I live out in Fairfax, have for 20 years. I love it here. Um, so I make documentary films. I, make, uh, I have two companies. One is, it's called the Redford Center in the Presidio, and we create media uh, meant to be used as tools for positive change. And we've done a number of films over the last decade. Uh, this is our most recent one. I also make films about health issues like dyslexia, uh, the, the dangers of childhood stress on their development. Uh, I did one called Toxic Hot Seat for HBO about flame retardants in our furnishings. Um, a, a, a community in New Jersey that was poisoned by the Ford Motor Company in their, their paint waste practices. So I go, I go both ways between health and environment. And in 2012, I was at the Sundance Film Festival with the film on dyslexia, and I sat and watched Chasing Ice. And I thought to myself, well, here it is. I mean, what else do we have to say or what else do we have to see? This is it. This is the moment. But it wasn't the moment. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. What is going on? I mean, you could say that there is a crafty lobby, lobby um, lobbyist out there, well-funded lobby organizations that are meant to disrupt our messaging and keep us from understanding this stuff. Maybe a little bit. Um, you know, is there is there a, a a bombardment of media choices that keeps us from seeing things? Yes, yeah, somewhat. But I actually feel like there's something deeper going on. It has to do with um, denial and um, indifference and what tr can trigger this. And I remember one night I was driving back home and I started thinking at, at, about um, the apocalypse and how every major world religion has an apocalyptic scenario and has since the beginning of the revolution. So, um, so and I, you know, I, I use sort of narrative rather than a myth for those of you that are devout, but it's there. And so for thousands of years, we've been thinking about the end times, um, regardless of what religion you're in, more or less, and thinking about a time when the, the world is going to go up in flames. So what's happened in the last 30 years? There's been an increasing body of evidence from scientists who usually don't agree with people that have uh, apocalypse myth, stepping forward and saying, you know, the monks were right. And that's incredible, right? And so if you have, the, we're, we're in a scenario where we have these poles agreeing on one thing, and that's this uh, impending doom in our future. Isn't the best thing to watch Michael Jackson videos or, or ch children dancing like Michael Jackson in the face of something so overwhelmingly depressing and apocalyptic? Don't most people feel like, geez, this is way over my head. I can't do anything about this. So. Um, and, and, you know, there has been a lot of work done to en enlighten the public about the risk of climate change. So um, looking at that, I thought, well, you know, what, what else is there in the, in sort of, if I see myself as a member of a team that's trying to help the situation, what else can we do? And it doesn't take long looking around at the basic facts around where renewable energy is now, or even four years ago when I first looked into it, to see that something special was starting to happen, having to do with the economics and scalability. So I decided at that point to tell the story. And I decided to tell, you know, after thinking a lot about it, I, I realized, well, I'm a bit of a fraud. I'm somewhat of a hypocrite. I was still, <laughs> still driving around a gas car, still uh, leaving the lights on way more than I should, still not really filling up the washing machine the way I should, not entirely doing all the right things. And now I'm going to come in with a didactic lecture about what we should all be doing. I'm just going to be the problem. I'm going to be yet another example of sort of the liberal elite storytelling that creates the problem that only makes the problem worse in some ways. So I just decided to throw it open and, ex and just go into this thing and learn about renewable energy, try to figure out what's going on, take a look at the obstacles, and do my best to honestly convey what I know with the truth of my sort of Luddite state. Um, and so that was the style of the film. And to give you a, just a taste of it, um, I've got a clip here. Uh, Chris, are you here in the room somewhere? Oh, hi there. How about the clip? And this is, uh, this is uh, yeah, I'll set it up. I'm about to, this is early in the film, and I've decided to go explore on site some renewable energy.
Hi, Lindsay. What's up? I'm thinking, you know, when you come home, how about you come on a road trip with me to explore some renewable energy in the desert? What? Why would I go? <laughs> because you're really fun, and I just, I'm just always looking for an excuse to be around you. Don't you feel like you should bring someone who actually knows about that stuff? Like, <laughs> someone to counter your ignorance? <laughs> we can't just have two, like, dum dums out there on the road. I'd like to say that was the first time my daughter drop kicked one of my plans, but it would be a lie. However, I did have better luck with an entrepreneur and musician friend who builds guitar amps in his spare time. You can make an argument that, well, maybe it's too late. That's, that's one argument, right? Screw it. <laughs> We're all you know, suck the carbon down and, you know, wait for the apocalypse. The counter argument is every little bit helps. You know, We're on the site of the world's largest commercial solar thermal facility. So we have almost 180,000 heliostats, what we call heliostats, the mirrors that are surrounding, and three you know, significant towers. I'm going to do something at, at great risk to my own image, and that is try and explain what this plant is doing right great. now. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even worse. <laughs> yeah. There's a star up here emitting ultraviolet light. It's coming down. I'd go with infrared on that, Jamie. Okay, okay. <laughs> infrared. Because we're talking about heat, and it's hitting hundreds of thousands of mirrors. And the cool thing about these mirrors, we're all aiming at that. And that's why that thing is glowing like the eye of Sauron <laughs> as we're standing here. That's not the end of it, though. Apparently, there's water in there. And it superheats, and it drives that steam down that tower and goes somewhere and turns turbines and makes electricity and goes off. Touche. Touche, <laughs> David. From our perspective, if you thought that we were going to burn coal 100 years from now, and that that was going to be a sustainable approach, I think you're grossly underestimating the trajectory of technology. Right. So there's very competitive electricity from renewables. The problem is the intermittency. Right. So solar thermal is clearly aimed, when we compete against renewables, we're competing against the fact that we, we can deliver energy on demand, so we're dispatchable. When we compete against a, a gas plant, we're competing against the fact we don't have emissions. They do. And we're supplying power to California Grid. That's right. We're part of the renewable mix. We think the current grid system could sustain 25 to 30 percent renewables with a smarter grid, meaning we could manage the intermittency of renewables better. You can get even higher penetration. California's talking about a 50 percent standard. There were, of course, environmental issues building this plan out here. Sure. But very significantly, you didn't clear a bunch of land. You can mm -hmm. see there's, there's weeds growing underneath these, uh, these reflectors. Right. Um, it was all done in place, basically, right? Any power plant is going to be invasive, by definition. Mm -hmm. It's a physical facility. If you build a building, you build a power plant. Sure. So the trade is, what can you do to be least environmentally impactful? There's a small group of people who wouldn't want the desert intruded on for any purpose. Sure. And for them, there's no solution. There's nothing you can do to say, we've mitigated, we've done the best we can. I went to West Point, got my oh. engineering degree at West oh, Point. Oh, you were military. Oh. Tell me again, you think this is invasive, so you'd rather go out and protect our oil interests in places that hate us, and for that, you're willing to trade dollars and bodies, and that's a good trade for you. That's a good trade. So, um, I don't, you know, this, this movie, in some ways, it's, most of you in the room will know everything and will know that the vast majority of stuff in this film is already out of date. I mean, the grid is, uh, the Cal ISO is already handling way more uh, clean energy than he was talking about in this clip. It's one of the frustrating things in this film is things are just evolving so rapidly that there's no way by the time we finished making this film it was going to be up to date. And that's a good thing. Right? That's a good thing. So I can live with that. So, um, so it ultimately what goes on here is I, I, I learned a lot about how it, how it can all come together. And, and I tried to focus on those things that are apolitical. I tried to point out the fact that this clean energy revolution is not just a tight green circle. That this is happening on both sides of the aisle once you get down below Washington. 
Um, and I, I had a number of people, including the mayor of Georgetown, Texas, Republican mayor of to Second City to take the, the community 100% renewable in this country, and why? And I uh, went and visited the Navy, a whole bunch of other things as well, just trying to not uh, fall into this polarized uh, dynamic that we're in in terms of the storytelling when it's not necessary. The truth is that we, you can tell this story without either just resigning to uh, rallying your base. You can actually cross the line and start to re reach people. So I, I, for me, it was really, uh, that was probably one of the most interesting things to learn. I also saw how important policy is and how important the political process is. When I started, I was excited about the idea of not going there about the politics. I, I, I felt like maybe we could just get there uh, with largely market-based solutions. And, um, and it seemed really refreshing to me. And that was before the current election. It was already seeming refreshing to me. So, but ultimately what I learned from what I witnessed in the state of Nevada with what the Public Utilities Commission did there to try and eliminate rooftop solar in the state is that politics do matter. And engagement does matter and can make a difference. And I saw that happen in Nevada, um, much for the betterment of, of solar in that state. And so I don't, you know, I, I don't, if you ask me, you know, are you upset about the changes coming with, to our climate? Yes, I am. I, I, and I, I, I don't think we can avoid a lot of it, but we can really prevent the worst scenarios. We still have an opportunity to really, really reduce the worst case scenarios with the technologies we have right now. We can do this. And I, there's all kinds of reasons to be hopeful in spite of, um, you know, in spite of what's going on in Washington. In fact, the very last line in this movie is a lawmaker in, Wa in Nevada saying, if Washington's not going to do this, we will. And I think that's a rallying cry right now. And there's plenty of evidence that that's what's happening. I mean, I look at, uh, well, first of all, you know, let's all celebrate the fact that Marin Clean Energy is sitting here in Marin County. Can we give a hand to those guys? I remember, I remember thinking, oh, pg and is going to ground these guys to a pulp. And I, it's going to be nasty. And, you know, they fought. And now pg and is trying to copy them. And that's a good thing. So, you know, that to me is really rewarding. I also, as I said, in Nevada, I saw the, the legislature come back and say, hey, wait a minute. The Utility Commission, three guys, that's not cool. We're going to change the laws. And they did. A, a nine out of 11 clean energy bills that cl cleared the, the legislature in Nevada last, this last session got signed into law by a Republican governor. So that, that's really encouraging, and there are a lot of other states that can follow that, that plan. You also have, uh, you know, there's an organization called Environmental Voters uh, that's a nationwide organization um, that's, that its focus is pretty interesting. Uh, this fellow, Nathaniel Stinnett, and he, he's a longtime Democratic um, policy analyst and a speech writer. He's worked with many of the leading Democratic candidates for Senate. Um, the long of it is, he's able to figure out the profile of voters, and he was able to determine that in the last election, uh, the national election, 15 million self-declared environmentalists did not show up on election day. And that there's this strange thing that happens, which is in spite of how much they care and what, what they do in their homes and their communities, they don't vote as much as they could. And so he's got an, a, a, a nationwide effort to get environmentalists to actually show up because he thinks it's easier to change people's habits than change their minds. And there's a gold mine out there of change waiting if people can just start voting for what they actually feel. And he's going hard on that one. <laughs> and lastly, because I want a beer like everybody else, um, the real, for me, the hope is uh, you just look at the scale of, of what's possible. Uh, and, and I looked at China, which is one of the, the, the biggest offenders in terms of CO2 emissions. But they're also showing great creativity and drive to do things in a new way. Um, just this year, there's a, a district in China. And the grid system in that district decided, gee, I wonder how much we, renewable energy we can handle. And can we go 100% renewable in this district with this utility district? And for seven days, a district with a population of 6 million people ran on 100% renewable energy for seven days straight. 
So that's, that's smaller than the Bay Area, but not that much smaller than the entire Bay Area. They, uh, they didn't burn, in other words, they didn't burn a half a million tons of coal for that week. So we're already hitting scalable solutions that are completely inspiring. So my feeling is when you're out there talking to people and talking to friends, talking to family, um, it's sort of like it was with you know, the Golden State Warriors or back when the Giants were doing great and, or the 49ers. When a team starts to win, uh, everybody jumps on board. And this is, this is starting to win. So everybody should get excited about it because we know what the problems are going to be. Let's get excited about the solutions. So thank you very much. Okay, so questions? Is there a qu Hello? Is there a question, please? Yeah, so, so I guess the philosophical question is how much are we going to sacrifice in the name of these big projects and denigrate the value of the environment and the living species there because we need more energy when a person can say that none of that was harmed when there is so much documentation about how the desert with Okay, so you're, go ahead and finish up. Yeah, thank you. So um, if there's an interesting split right now in the environmental community. There are people who legitimately feel the way you do, and you have every right to feel that way, and I wouldn't get in the way of your passion or your, your, the feelings you have about this at all. And I think, you know, just depending on what room you're in, you'll also encounter people that say, um, you know, we don't want to play the fiddle while Rome is burning. And there's, we, have a, we have a responsibility, such a massive scale, to replace fossil fuels, which are ultimately so much more threatening to the very things you care about. And there's no easy solution. In some ways, and, and you know, we, we, we looked at that, and we, we, I could have gone on and on about what they did at that plant to, uh, to help the, the, turtles, the desert turtles and the money they spent to increase the population there. But for me, it's like, come on, man. There's no free lunch. So this is just me speaking. I have a megaphone of a documentary, and I stand by how I feel, which is I don't want to sit there and watch, uh, watch the massive scale changes occur that affect millions of people who live in poverty uh, and not ignore what these solutions are. And that, that technology is a small part of, of, of many things that are going to go on that are going to upset people about some of the, some of the offset of, of natural spaces. So in the state of California, you had a really good compromise, I feel. I think folks like you were really disappointed by the, the state plan to protect the desert. And I think people who are really trying to scale up and do massive scale renewables were also disappointed in that plan. And for me, that's a win. <laughs> so. Other, another question? Back there? Thank you. Yeah, Dale? You're asking me if, to replace my gas car? I did it. I did it. <laughs> right, say that again. Make sure I heard you. Well, I mean, who, who, has, who has kids between the age of 10 and 25? Do I need to answer this? <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're never a hero in your own home. 
That's for sure. But, you know, I think her feeling is, is, and she did have an impact on the film because she pointed out the fact that if you don't, if you don't cover um, the social aspects of environmental justice, I'm going to be pissed. And so there's a stretch in the film that, that takes a look at some of that. But honestly, um, I, I hope there are more movies that look at that issue because when you look at fossil fuels, putting aside climate change, we have every reason to do everything we're doing right now with renewables based on social justice alone, uh, globally. So I think that you'll, you'll see that happen. Couple more questions. All right. Yep, go ahead. I just want to say um, the word compromise is not some people using some people winning. It's we're, we're speaking and moving, trying to get the momentum to move forward. Every step we take is pushing against the oil industry, pushing the food and energy just to the press against us, the deniers. Every step forward, making headway is a good thing. So if we feel like we lose on some I'm sorry, I, I, could, I couldn't really make out your question. I have a question. <laughs> so his, his, I mean, his point was that any, any movement towards, you know, sort of progress um, is a good thing. And, you know, you, you kind of look at the compromises that you make, or it's not exactly a compromise. It's more of a cost-benefit analysis. Well, yeah. Um, I don't, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, so there's probably yeah, other ahead. people in this room far more educated than I am to answer that one. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, when and where can I see your film? Because I apologize, I haven't seen it yet. So no, no. when next may I see it? So uh, it's, it's an interesting process. So we made the film, and it's really a half, halfway done at this point now that the film's done. Because, uh, you know, as any impact documentary maker, filmmaker will tell you, it's now our job to make sure the film gets where it needs to go. So in that regard, the Redford Center, you know, as I was making the film and meeting people in this industry and meeting the change agents, I, we were sort of cultivating relationships with people that would be able to help us get the film out. So what happens initially is December 11th, it airs on HBO. That'll go to a million people. And then after that, we have a window in which we do community screenings. And so. Uh, Rocco Films, which is based out of Sausalito, Annie Roney of Rocco Films, the, the, number one, the number one educational distributor, if not in the world, certainly in America, they'll be rolling out uh, with the educational version of the film coming. Uh, it'll start selling sometime in the spring and be available not long after that. Uh, but we have two things. We have a, a higher education, which would be pretty much this film, but we're also going to cut a 40-minute version that will fit in classrooms, K through 12. And we have a whole series of allies that are going to help us work to get into schools. So that'll be, so the first thing is community screenings available from our website, theredfordcenter.org. Um, and then Rocco Films will be distributing the educational. And then it'll run on HBO and be available on HBO Now and Go uh, for a long time. Thank you. Yeah. I'll tell you what, folks, we're going to wrap it up. Thank okay. you to Jamie. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Good job.